Good afternoon. My name is Dave Yoho, and I am a veteran of World War II. I was born August 19th, 1928. The cursed war that we were involved in started on December 7th, 1941. I was 13 years of age. We had a country that uh, population of 130 million. We eventually put 16 million men in uniform, and that represented 12 and a half percent of our population. Seldom ever done before in any nation, may not ever happen again. I represent a brand or a branch of the military because we became military. The Merchant Marine is largely a civilian organization. It existed since before the Revolutionary War. It is the merchant ship that carried goods from and to. In this case, however, in about the late 19th, let's say around 1938, where the harbingers of war were out there, we, the United States Merchant Marine, got adopted by an organization called the U.S. Maritime Service, which was originated then to recruit men to fill the ships that were needed to send cargo and personnel to various parts of Europe, the South Pacific, the Mediterranean, and what have you. But let me take a step back. We were ill-prepared for war in this country. We were ill-prepared, and yet there were some steps taken. As an example, the United States Maritime Service, which, by the way, when the war ended, was discontinued, was created and they recruited 250,000 mostly young men, to uh, work on those ships, to be on those ships. Now, a merchant ship will carry goods, materials, tanks, guns, uh, weaponry. It carries food, clothing, and sometimes the ships are troop ships that carry personnel. The peculiar part of World War II is we are in the United States, but we didn't fight here. There was only one thing that even came close, and that was off the coast of Alaska. And Alaska was not a state at that time. So what, what we were uh, brought about to do with these 250,000 men, they would be put on merchant ships, of which they built 1,500 new merchant ships, put in, under something called the War Shipping Administration. They had three training centers for enlisted personnel, one training center for officers in the United States. And I served in one of those training centers run by the Navy, mandated by the Coast Guard in a place called Sheep's Head Bay, New York. Now I want you to envision, I was 15 years of age when I decided, as many others did, I wanted to serve my country. So I went down to enlist in the Navy. I had a forged birth certificate. They accepted me, gave me a physical, and <laughs> then they found out that I was underage. So I came home from school that day, or wherever else I was doing, and found the police at my house, telling my parents I was a truant and that I had enlisted, and, and so it went from there. And you can, if, I don't know, your parents would react. Mine didn't react too good to all this. But along came the idea that that falsified person gave impetus to what other people were doing. This was patriotism. We wanted to serve. We wanted to serve this great country, although we had just risen from the greatest depression the world had ever seen. My family, I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, and uh, my family lived in a rented home. Uh, the rent was $11 a month rent. Uh, a, a quart of milk was 10 cents, a loaf of bread was 10 cents, a gallon of gas was probably 11 cents. But you look at what that was at that time. And so we rose out of this depression, and with a patriotic force, we decided to serve. Now I do tell you that uh, there's a lot of misinformation about the U.S. Merchant Marine. We'll try to clear it up. Remember, I said it existed before the Revolutionary War as a civilian organization. Along came the United States Maritime Service, and they became the training center. Along came the War Shipping Administration. They built 1,500 ships, cargo ships, deep in their bellies. We carried 15 million tons of goods 
to the European theaters. We carried an additional 8 million goods to the Mediterranean, 13 million to the South Pacific, and 5 million tons to Russia. And during the course of that, this organization to which I belong suffered the highest casualty rate of any. 732 ships were sunk. We had the highest casualty rate, one out of 26 of the 250 died. They never came back. And then there were some mysterious rumors about we were some unique group that was civilian and got all kinds of money to do this, and such is not the truth. The peg raids were not too dissimilar as to the Brotherhood on the ship. The gunners were from uh, the United States Navy, and we came out of the United States Merchant uh, Marines or the U.S. Maritime Service. The peg raids weren't that much, that, unless when the ship, if the ship was attacked in a combat area and that ship was sunk, you got a thousand dollars. That was a bonus, a lot of money at that time. But what you don't know from history, and hopefully this will be extended so other people know, our pay stopped the day that ship was sunk. The pay stopped. Nothing you don't know. When our ships were sunk and we were taken into prisoner of war camps, our pay stopped there as well. It was only after the war that we were given a dollar a day. So a guy that spent three and a half years in a war camp, and particularly the, uh, the Japanese prison internment, uh, that guy got maybe $1,100 for that period of time. Now through it all, we were youth. We didn't know any better. We were doing what we thought was right. And I have to tell you, if any of you have any decisions about doing this, it's wrong. As much patriotism is involved. At 15, I couldn't make it. I went again and enlisted in the U.S. Maritime Service. And by the time I got ownership, I was 16. I want you to envision yourself at 14, 15, 16 years of age. What wisdom do you have locked in your brain? What do we really know at that age, myself included? But we thought we knew and we had a sense of bravado that you might have today. It doesn't work because I was interviewed a few years ago by the Stars and Stripes, which is a publication for veterans, and they asked me, did you understand this was a mistake doing what you did? Yes. I said, when did you understand? I said, the day I got there. Because instantaneously, bang, just like that, bang, just like that, you stop being a youth and you're an adult. And you get up when someone else tells you to get up. You go where someone else tells you to go. You go to bed when someone else tells you to go. And you stand watches. Now watches on a merchant ship are four and eights, which means we serve a watch if we start, uh, let's say at eight in the morning, you serve from eight to 12. You break and then you get seven, but at four o'clock in the year, seven hours off, four o'clock in the afternoon, you're back on duty again. It throws your whole system out of uh, sync. Um, the war ended August 15th, 1945, and four days after that war ended, I turned 17. I was at the invasion of Okinawa in the South Pacific. I was on something called a fleet oiler. It's like a gas station for ships, and we refueled these other ships. And I was on one of those ships. And it was one of the most ridiculous endings of an invasion. It, it was a hard and cruel invasion. In the meantime, our country dropped two bombs. Uh, they were atomic bombs. There were critics in the fact that we dropped the bombs. But we knew by then when the Japanese would be willing to sacrifice 100,000 troops. We lost 80, 28,000. They lost 100,000 in Okinawa. We knew that they would never stand for us invading their country. So they dropped these two bombs and the war came to an end. Now let me do a flashback. What's it like being at sea? Let me recite something from my comrades, people I've known. In June 
1942, seven months after the war began, we put a first convoy together, started on the East Coast. Now, incidentally, in the Atlantic Theater, which means that's right off the coast, the East Coast of the United States, in that Atlantic Theater, we lost a majority of our shipping immediately because the German Wolfback, which were the German submarines that were housed in Germany, and when Japanese forces attacked us, three days later Hitler declared war on us, and those submarines were already there off our coast. And in that small smidgen of time, our ships were not armed, and they came down the coast, and the German submarines sat out there and seeing the silhouettes and could determine what the ship was, and we got torpedoed. And during the uh, early stages of the war, that was called the Great Atlantic, the Great Atlantic registered um, the high shipping disasters that the world had ever seen, because we weren't protected. And the German submarines attacked us right off the coast. But during that period of time, someone got the bright idea, we have to reinforce our ally, who was Russia. So there was a convoy put together, and it was called the Murmansk, M-U-R-M-A-N-S-K, Murmansk Run. And that's in a peculiar part of Russia called Archangel. And so if you were to look that up on the map, you would see it's right off the Barents Sea. We put 34 shiploads of goods and personnel together in the convoy surrounded by 22 convoy ships, which means military ships, there to protect us. And we started through the Atlantic, and we get over close to the Barents Sea in five days before we get to Archangel, and let me tell you what it was like. The temperature, 45 degrees below zero in the water. If your ship sinks, you have four and a half minutes before it takes your life. Four and a half minutes. 34 ships moved in there. Only 11 of them got through because five days out of Murmansk, the British who were in charge of the convoy withdrew all of our naval support. The 22 ships were picked up and sent elsewhere because in a place in Norway where a German battleship was housed, the Tirpitz, was the largest, most formidable battleship in the world, and that's where it was, and they thought they were going to bring that battleship out and attack. So they sent the combat part of us together, the combat ships, and sent them in, in, in towards where the Tirpitz were scheduled to be. Tirpitz never came out. We were taken by German submarines, aircraft, and only 11 ships got through. Now I hesitate because it's painful for me to tell you this. When you're in a theater war, you know when you're going to die. It's no secret. You know you can't hit that water. And they did it. Now for good reason we kept that kind of secret. The press didn't want to talk about that, and rightfully so. We needed to have the American public and the, uh, and the world see that we were fostering, fostering well in this war, and we weren't at that time. Now let me take you to the second a horrible, horrible theater involving merchant ships. And this is in December of 1943 in a uh, small uh, port in Italy on the Adriatic called Bari, Bari, Italy. Bari, Italy is a beautiful part. If you ever visit Italy today, you're going to see it's a gorgeous place. But then it was a port. It was a small port. And we had the 13th Air Force that was housed in Foggia, which was near there. And we had the British forces, General Montgomery, in charge of that whole area. And on this Sunday of December 2nd, 1943, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 105 German Hinkels, 
they are German aircraft, flew over this port. There were 17 ships tied up, meaning they were lugged in there. 17. There were 22 ships in all. But on one of those ships, there was a cargo of 500 tons of mustard gas bombs. Mustard gas was outlawed after World War I because the heinous things it did to human life and human sacrifice. And supposedly no one knew that the bombs were in the crater of that ship. And that ship, and normally when you see ships tied up, here, uh, here's the wharf and they're tied up next to the wharf like this. That harbor was so crowded that they should park the ships like this. They watch again with their nose into the port. And the ships were tethered together. And when that ship was struck, struck and caught on fire, it exploded. It disintegrated like that. Every human life on that ship was gone. And half of the crew on the adjoining ships were gone. A cloud of mustard gas hangs over Barry, Italy. It's an orange-gray cast. And you inhale mustard gas and you get conflictions in your medical being that destroy your lung base, your hearing base, your eye, uh, uh, other parts of your anatomy. The original toll, 1,000 died that day. That's military and the civilians who were in the, uh, in that area, the Italian civilians who came to serve the needs of the military. 1,000 died. It was never revealed what caused that. Those people suffered inflictions that caused them their life later. There's a great book written about it called The Great Secrets and why we had to do this, why it had to be. Now, let me give you an overall reflection. I love my country. I preach patriotism. I salute my flag and will fight anybody who burns my flag. At my age, I am 95 years of age. I will not tolerate that. I will not tolerate it because my comrades pledge their life, their souls, their history, and their experience. And when the war was over, sad things occurred. Turns out in 1945, when they put the GI Bill together for everyone else, we were left out. We were left out of the GI Bill. So we came home and whatever hospitalization we had to have, we paid for. If we wanted to go to night school, we paid for that. If we had any kind of need to build a house or whatnot, we paid for that. There was no support. And incidentally, they returned it they found out it was a mistake, and they returned it. Now keep in mind, uh, I'm telling you that the GI Bill was in 1945. 43 years later, 1988, 43 years later, they reinstated the GI Bill for the U.S. Merchant Marines. I was one of the people that received that. But the interim, I was 60 years old. I paid my way through night school. I paid my way through my college education. I paid my medical bills. I came home before pertinent diseases, not the least was malaria and something called asbestosis because I served in an engine room. And I came home with bleeding ulcers. And then a fourth thing, which I am not easily discussable, uh, it, it really deals with uh, post-traumatic stress. But you see, we were given an opportunity to serve our country. And so we didn't stand in bitterness and decry what we didn't have. In my speeches today, I make them all over the world. Look at 95, I'm still making speeches. And as late as May of 2022, I received the Congressional Gold Medal in Congress and made a speech there in nine and a half minutes, like I'm doing today without notes. But I'm not speaking for Dave Yoho. I'm speaking for the military. I'm speaking for not only the husbands and sons that went into the war, but for the women who supported that war.
and went into the trenches. The trenches, so being, they went into the factories. They drove the streetcars, the buses. They did the job that our men, don't forget, 12.5% of our population were no longer there. They did the job that those men did. So someone wrote a book and called us the greatest generation. But we're slowly ebbing away. Uh, of the uh, 16 million that were recruited, there are less than 200,000 alive throughout the whole world of uh, American servicemen. In the group I was in, that 250,000, there are under 1,500 of us alive. And there were nine of us that received the Congressional Gold Medal. And I am forever grateful to my country for having given me the opportunity to serve. I ask the schools, the educational centers of our world to tune into our pain, tune into the logical things that we think about, the logical and the illogical. We were young. And so I say to everyone, and I said this in Congress, when you are with others, tell them about us. And tell them what you heard here today. And search our archives. Look me up, Dave Yoho. Look me up in my speech in Congress or at the World War II Memorial where a million two hundred thousand people heard my, heard my statements. And then say to them, we, our soul cries out and says, when you're with others, tell them that we gave up our yesterdays for your and their and the futures for their tomorrows. And if anyone says, who said these words to you, tell them. There was a 16-year-old boy inside of a 95-year-old veteran of World War II. God bless the United States of America. God bless my, 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 those who served with me. God bless all members of the armed services, now and even thereafter, Korea, the, the uh, Vietnam conflict. And above all, God bless my brothers in the United States Merchant Marines. And so now I understand that you have the opportunity to ask me questions. I will answer most of them as truthfully as possible. Let's hear them. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning and also for everything you did in World War II and the great efforts you've made since then to educate people about that wonderful service that you belong to, the Merchant Marines. Can you, where, where are you joining us from this morning? Well, I'm, I'm at my home office. I have an office, uh, I have a business office, uh, and now I'm at my home office. So uh, I'm in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Oh, okay. Great. You're not that far away then, because we're in, uh, I'm speaking to you from McLean, Virginia. Okay. We're, we're nearby, and we're both nearby the capital of our country, which is a wonderful country, but uh, a lot of strange people live and work and make laws in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about your actual war service? Um, what, what, what actually did you, when did you join the merchant service? And tell us a little bit about your war itself. Well, the, I, I did tell you, I, uh, I went in the uh, service when it was 1944 that uh, I originally went in. And uh, I was 15 when I started, 16 when I got our show. I was assigned to something called a fleet oiler. Now, we built all these ships because we had to transfer people, goods, services, uh, all kinds of armor. Uh, every, everything you can imagine had to be transferred from some place to those places where the battles were being formed. I was on a T2 tanker. It was very modern at the time, built by the War Shipping Administration. And we were put on that ship. Now, I was in the engine room. For whatever reason, I tell you, I volunteered to be in there, and it's stupid. Uh, the engine room on a tanker was 25 to 30 feet below the water. And uh, I, I'd never been on a ship. I'd never been on the ocean. And I was joined by people who came from small 
communities in, in the West and the like army, um, the agricultural community, they had never been on ships either. Now, when we were going through the Panama Canal, right, they, they would go through gunnery practice and on a ship, there's something called a cowl that sticks up in the air. It's really a thing that you're on a ship, it sucks in the air and drives it down to the rooms that are within the ship. Uh, and so when they had gunnery practice, I was on duty and I heard it goes off, it's uh, amplified like it's coming right next door to you. Uh, so I said to, I joke, I said, I said it to an older guy, an officer, he was probably, he was probably 22 years of age. And I said to him, uh, if we take a hit here, now we're we're 38 feet below waterline, what's the quickest way to get out? And he said, kid, if we take a hit, you don't get out. Now, I like that to be exemplified for duty that people give, sacrifice of youth that they give to their country. And so our job on that ship, and I served on watches and whatnot, and I was on, we went through the Panama Canal into the Pacific Ocean. And from the point we came in on the Pacific side, it's about a 22 or 23 day voyage out to where we rendezvoused. We rendezvoused the first time in a place called Ulithi. It became famous after the work was they tested uh, a, a bomb there after the war. And then you convoyed with other ships. Uh, we either dropped oil there, picked up oil there. It, it's a very complicated process. But um, the the concept of what we faced is no different than that. Like we had radar stations in in the uh, in the far regions of the world. Uh, in let's say in the, the North Pole, we had at the South Pole, we had radar stations in there and we dropped service people in there and they stayed there for months without seeing another human being. Now, what specific questions does someone have? You ask me a question and I try to give you my very best answer. And at the same time, I try to be ambiguous. I want to be speaking for those 1500 guys that are still alive and the 250,000 of them that bit the dust and uh, war is horrible and it's tough growing old and being forgotten and it's not my case but the case of most people in my in my class of big uh we have a question here from lois um was the training as a young merchant marine sailor different than the training of other navy men well i don't know I, the comparative yes yeah, i'd say yes they put you i was in sheepshead bay and you go up there and uh, you go through basic training first and uh, uh the marching the drilling and but they tell you when to get up in the morning when to go to bed at night but uh, then when i decided that i wanted to be in the engine room training for whatever reason it's only commerce they, they had the model of, uh, of that being taught there, and they taught gunnery. We were giving gunnery practice and abandoned ship proxies and an uh, inner lifeboat and whatnot. But, you know, it's, it's a cloistered environment. You're with other people, and you're under regiment, and uh, you're no longer a boy. You, the minute you get in there, uh, you're an adult. When we're put on our first ship, uh, I had probably, I don't know, 10 weeks of training. The guy in the deck crew, he went in for six. And if you were a messman, which was one of the lower ports, it went in at four weeks. We needed men. Um, I don't say this tongue in cheek. I understand. The reason we were recruited, originally, you had to be 18 years of age to go in any of the services. They relax it for the U.S. Navy and the uh, Marines. They relax that to 17, but you had to have your parents' permission. They relax the, uh, for the U.S. Maritime Service. It went from 18, 17, and went down to 16. They actually recruited 16-year-old kids, and I are it. I, I'm the kind of thing they recruited. 
So the training, uh, the, nothing prepares you for the transmission from teenage to adult, nothing. If you've experienced it yourself and you lived at home, you did all the dumb and stupid things that you couldn't get away with before because uh, you were now on the verge of being adult. We were no different than you, but we went away. And when we came home, now, now keep in mind, when we came home, there was a, a great recession in our country because everybody was coming home at the same time. So you bring the sicknesses of war, you bring the changes in the economy and sociologic changes. The war is over. Let's forget about it. Let's move on. I don't know what else I could tell you, uh, but uh, I, I don't regret any of it. Uh, uh, as I stand and sit before you right now, eh, I, I would do it over again because I do love my country. I don't like some of the things my country does and is doing. Well, I love my country, and I will always be a patriot that stands when that flag is wow. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, by the way, I don't know. Everybody says it. I, I was 13 years of age. I was playing with some friends. but We were playing baseball or something near a, a fire station, and the fire station was showing us how men go down the pole, how they drain the hoses, and even how a guy will come down a net from a three-story uh, fire station. And in the midst of that, there was a bullhorn, and they said to us, please go to your home. If you're on the streets today, please go to your home. The uh, uh, United States of America has been under attack by the Japanese government, and they said Pearl Harbor. We didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Uh, uh, Pearl Harbor is part of the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands didn't become a state. So like, we had 48 states in those days. And yeah, I do remember. And I was uh, 13 and uh, stuff started uh, immediately that were civilian issues. But then my friends, I was, uh, the guys I hung out with, I was 13, they were 15, 16, and as a year or two passed, we became desperate for more recruits, and they all went into service as well, and I wanted to go too, even though I was younger. I do remember it, remember it uh, very well. Did joining up seem like a big adventure to you? I mean, you were a boy, you weren't even an adult yet. Did it seem like a big adventure? <laughs> well, in fact, I'll tell you. Part of the patriotic theme is to watch parades and see the guys in uniform. And you see a guy in the uniform was attractive to girls like the guys in uniform. So that was one of the intriguing parts. Now, you, you, you don't even remotely think about what you're going to be doing or what you're going to be put into or the kind of people you're affiliated, associated with, the kind of things they do. Don't think, listen, when I came home, uh, uh, as I said, I was four, four days after the war ended. I came home. I lived in Pennsylvania. I was not old enough to drive a car. I could not own a car in that state. I wasn't old enough to vote, and I could not go into a restaurant or a bar to buy a drink. And yet I had served here, and I'd served with a, during a, a, a horrible, horrible time there. You know, there were 50 plus million people that died in World War II. And so you, you think you're going to go and do something that's wonderful. And when you come home, you find out, well, that's over now. Let's get on to the next thing. So I, uh, I didn't even have a high school education. I came home, I'd gone away. I was, in, um, I was junior in high school, so I had to come home. And, and get a, a GED was uh, the general equivalency diploma. I was able to get that and pass it. I'm a little concerned about it, but when I went and took it, it was a piece of cake. And then I enrolled in night school on an accelerated course. And I worked during the day and uh, went to school at night. And I do not recommend it to most people, but for me, it worked. Next. So, uh... When was the first time you had a drink then? Are you, do, you, do you expect us to believe that you never had a drink while you were in service during World War II in the, in the Merchant Marine? Okay. When was, when was your first drink? 
If, when the law says you may not drink until you're 18, I believe in obeying laws. And my wife is sitting near me today and about to clunk me. Uh, I probably took my first drink in a bar before I was 15 years of age. And I grew up in the inner city and just some things about the behavior you have. I was stabbed twice before I was old enough to drive a car. I was drive before I was 16. I did everything and some things which I do not care to discuss on your program today, but I did everything that adult people do. And it, it, it's, uh, it's not good. It is not good for you personally. You may think as a child at 14, 15, 16, that you're mature and able to do it, boy or girl. And I'm just telling you just some things in life you're not ready for. But I'm sure you got some better questions than asking me that. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good question, actually. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like growing up in uh, Depression-era Philadelphia? Th those were mean streets, yeah? Yeah, it was. And I I don't go, I say I, don't, I would only go back there as a hostage. But, <laughs> but it's a great learning experience because I'm not alone. And, and here's the thing that fosters what I do today. I speak all over the world. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, called upon because I'm a living voice. I get called upon for all the great celebrations, whether it's D-Day or VJ Day. I get called for those. So it's a great experience for me. And I say to myself that I was born and directed to what I do. And I bring these things out. But take growing up in the city. No, it's not good. But I'm not alone. And the guy that grew up in a farm somewhere in uh, Nebraska, and they put him on the train and brought him all the way east to go to basic training, it's even tougher for him. And many of these people had never been away from home. And my parents, uh, my father maybe had an eighth or ninth grade education. My mother maybe had a seventh or eighth grade education. And her her father was functionally illiterate. He could neither read nor write. A wonderful man, neither write. So I was born in, in tough times with tough people. And uh, I find no benefit in ever bemoaning every part, uh, any part of your life. No, don't, don't spend, don't waste any time. If young people hear this, or if you're in the profession where you teach other people, it's a waste of time to bemoan what you don't have. And for lots of reasons, it, it is a waste of time unless you feel that you can never go any further in life. Now, look, look at the benefits. When I came home, I was 17. I, was, I had a lot more street smarts than the average guy at 17. When I went to night school with 18-year-old people, uh, I had already, uh, it, it, when the war, I didn't get home right away. I was in uh, on, on a ship that delivered goods and services to Europe, they were called UNRWA ships, and I was on it. But I came home a pretty mature guy. And so take advantage of where you are and what you're doing at a given time and knowing that it was purposeful, and you have to keep that in mind. What else? What was your fondest memory of World War II? What's your the fondest ended, memory? Probably the day it ended, no. Uh, well, well, here's uh, the great learning Great, great learning experience. We were totally unprepared for war. The Japanese just picked the wrong time and the wrong enemy. The Japanese attacked us on a Sunday in Pearl Harbor. Now, what many people don't know, our fleet, the major part of our fleet was there, and that's why they attacked us. They knock out our fleet, and they can do what they want in the world. But the day they attacked was a Sunday. They had a day to attack because some of the ships were not manned. And our, our battalion of those ships were away from the islands at the time. Plus, they had in, in the Pearl Harbor, on one of the islands, we had the fueling stations for all these ships. They didn't knock that out. They knocked out our ships, and they flew away. And incidentally, history does define that they knew they made a mistake. Because we were undermanned, we under, undermanned in all of our military and less equipped. But we went to it like no other nation in the world. And, and again, getting back to the women in the factories. And, and to give you one example, 
the uh, uh, part a uh, part of what happened when a plane plane was built, it, it then when it's built and it can fly. It had, let's say, it was built in Detroit. It had to be flown to somebody, let's say, Fort Ord, California. Women flew those planes. And those women were called wasps. And there were over a thousand recruited, and 39 of them died. Now, they didn't die in combat. You, your woman couldn't be in combat in those days, but they died because of malfunctions in the plane. The guys that were on our ship with us that were US Navy, and we got on, oh, okay, I guess. Most people don't know who they are, the armed guard. Most people don't know who the CBs are, the Navy, the Navy group that were construction. Two days after the landing on D-Day, they bring these guys in to build roads and places for the, for the tanks to run. They lay down steel decking and whatnot. Uh, we, we, we have a great, great nation built from those people. The sad part is when that war ended, we had the highest spousal abuse, highest divorce rate, highest level of alcoholism that has ever existed in our country, and suicide rate. That's an aftermath of war. The whole concept of war has to be taught in our school system. Not this one about what is the proper pronoun. I'm not knocking the way things are done. I'm telling you that I believe we make a mistake when we don't consider our history and what got us into the war. And politicians don't go to war. Politicians make the war. We go to war. Human beings go to war. I'm not knocking them. It's the way the system works. And we should be aiming at something that takes us out of that and understanding the lives of the people that gave up what they believed was their childhood that doesn't exist anymore. Well, you'll be very pleased to know that we at Friends are very busy doing that. We have a program called um, Character is Destiny, where we go into high schools, in uh, mainly in Virginia right now, but other parts of the United States. And we're teaching today's generation all about yours and trying to imbue them with the same sense of patriotism and the same values that led you to do the amazing things that you did, sir. That's what Friends is all about. I have several questions here, if you have time, yeah. and statements. Um, this is from Susan Yu, and she says, thank you, Dave, for your heartfelt story. We will remember you and your fellow Merchant Marines. Our good friend's father was in the Merchant Marines. He came home and lived a full life. And Susan adds, and this is the question she has for you, what words of wisdom do you have for current leaders to have peace in this complicated world? Well, first of all, to understand the disaster of the war, the consequences of war. And there's going to be a distortion, whether you like it or not. Those guys that are coming home, the wounded, and you see a lot of ads for them, the wounded because of pipe bombs or other forms of bombs that blow up their legs, their arms, or what have you. And when we are invited to the White House or the uh, Capitol, we interact with those people. The, the consequences of war have to be taught as an apparent factor. And love of country, which is de depreciating every day, as I see it, the lack of civility, the lack of understanding, and the lack of understanding uh, might be exemplified this way. When, when we were in the Vietnam War, long, long contest, but now young people were brought to think that what we did was wrong and maybe what we did was wrong, but we didn't do that. We went and fought the wars we were asked to fight. If you are being educated and you do not learn the major devastations of poor actions, unwise choices, you're doomed to repeat again and again and again. And when I speak to military groups and, and their children and and wherever it is that I'm usually down at the World War, uh, World War to Memorial, which is uh, uh, to me is a godly place. That's the message these things exemplify. But we've got to learn from those things and take those forward. Thank you for that statement. It's very important. That's you. You share the same mission. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Lois, and she says, 
when you read books today on the merchant marines, what do they get wrong? Um, and then she adds, my students and I are writing a lesson on wielding, on welding, on liberty and victory ships. But what, what do books about the merchant marines, what do they largely ignore or get wrong in your mind? Well, what I see, the way things are taught historical, it's about incidents, it's about wars, it's about those things without looking into what it costs to get there. Uh, two years ago at the 75th anniversary of the invasion, the D-Day invasion, we were invited there. And there are lots of veterans there. And uh, in that invasion, there were five beaches there. Now you'd have to study the geography and then to understand we put together the largest armada that has ever existed in the world and may never come again. The different the three different countries and some ancillary, but we work together there. Now, when we go there, and I see Omhawk Beach, and if you've ever watched the movie Saving Private Ryan, and you see the first 15, 20, 30 minutes of that, that's warfare. Ain't nothing funny. You have to have guts to sit there and look at it without tearing up. But in that movie, there is a scene where an old man is in the cemetery and he's a veteran and he's looking for a name on a cross and he kneels and he weeps as he says, did I leave? a worthy life, did what we agreed to do and did, were we worthy of being Americans? Now you take that history, take that phenomenon, and right next to Humboldt Beach is a thing called Pont du Hoc. It's, it's a ridge, goes straight up in the air. Early that morning, when the ships come in to drop off the troops, they shoot grappling hooks up that thing, and 250 guys start to climb that face. The Germans are on top shooting from the side and from the top down. And the minute one guy goes down, somebody else is blowing a whistle, and you go up that next row. And you get to the top. At the end of the day, those 250 guys, less than 90 were still standing, able to commit military do. That's what war is. War end. We get the Battle of the Bulge. Take your history lesson and look into the Battle of the Bulge. Now, when the uh, young guy is asking about the welding on the ships and whatnot, ships, merchant ships were not made for combat. But every merchant ship after the first six months was a combat ship because we had a large gun in front, three inch 50, a big one in the back, five inch 38, and eight, eight aircraft guns on that ship. Now, that ship had to be reconstructed to be what it is. And I'll give you one final thought because I deal with a lot with free association. I hear a subject in this with this young lady. One of the finest things our Navy has done are build hospital ships. There are two of them, one on the East Coast or on the West Coast. We were fortunate enough to be at the ceremonies for the Mercy that's on the East Coast, where they took a major tanker ship, gutted it, and built a hospital on top of that ship. You want your children to know about welding, just see what it took to build that and put it and keep it in place. And now you see that is the finished product. Then what did those people do? Everything that you can do in a the hospital, they do on that ship. It's uncanny. My wife and I were featured guests. The Navy treated us like, I get treated like royalty and I thank you, but I am truly representing other people. I'm not, you can't do anything for my career. It's already been well established. I have I have a quick question. Are you, are you the youngest World War II uh, veteran? Well, uh, keep in mind, you know, the, the space of time. Yes, I'm 95. And when we go to, when we were at the White House to get the Congressional Gold Medal, there were nine of us that, and I'm the only one not in a wheelchair. But then, then listen, I, uh, my buddy, Charles Mills, I got a, a, a good buddy I made through this. He's an African-American guy, and 
And the Merchant Marines were the first fully integrated service branch, the Merchant Marines. And Charles is an African American and he's 104 years old. And he's, his mind is about as active as a mouse looking for a hunk of cheese. He's right on top of everything. And so I think about that and I think, yeah, I'm the, uh, I am among the youngest and the dumbest that did it, but proud of, of what I did. Yeah, and the, so the average, just, just remember the war was over in 1945. Look how many years ago that is. So yeah, I am among the youngest. And listen, God granted me, I haven't lost my pipes. I, I'm in a business where I make speeches all the time and I make movies and training movies and do it on Zoom all the time. So I'm very fortunate and I married well. And that's the other key to, to leading great love. I have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wife and a wonderful childhood. And that part is all good because we made it good in the time of great turmoil. I'm not well, sure I'm answering all the questions the way you'd like them answered, but that's... yeah, you know, you're doing a fantastic job. I'm, I'm, I'm making notes here about married well. That's probably yeah. the biggest lesson for me from this whole morning. Thank you very much. Uh, why did it take until 1988 for merchant mariners to achieve veteran status? This seems to me to be uh, an absolute scandal that you guys didn't formally become veterans until. 1988. Why did it take so long? Well, first of all, the, the normal passage of time makes something less important. When the war was over, we had to go back. We had to come back to a country that had to take the factories out of making tanks and airplanes and put them back to making sewing machines and and uh, appliances. So that 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 was a graphic intent. Uh, secondly, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, it. it just doesn't work that way. Uh, you'd think that people would say, well, what about? Well, we were only 250,000 to start with, and they had a lot of misinformation about us, and they relied on the misinformation. A lot had to do with the press, too, the way we were epitomized. We were epitomized as people who supposedly made a, a lot of money out of what we did. And so people buy into that. Now, what does Congress or the Senate both houses, what do they concentrate on? They concentrate on issues of pertinence, and that usually means something that's happened today. And so they go back in time and they take a look at what happened. Uh, we have a military school to train officers for the U.S. Merchant Marine. It survived U.S. Maritime Service, and it's a place called Kings Point, New York. Those guys who were graduates there, graduate different than any of the other service academies. Instead of completing the three or four years of service, I mean, of, uh, of training, before you become a Naval officer, Marine officer, what have you, these guys uh, leave about nine months open at the end, and they're sent to sea. And they are sent to sea, and... Uh, I think 154 of them never came back to pick up, never came back to pick up their, uh, uh, their cause they were killed. Is it, is it true that, is it true that you today still don't receive full veterans benefits? I never took a penny, never got a penny in the beginning. I could get some now, but listen, I could by the time they gave me the GI Bill of Rights, I was already pretty high up in the corporate world, and it didn't mean anything to them. But that is true. Uh, I have friends who suffered. Uh, they, the thing I have, asbestosis. Asbestosis is a disease that comes from being in the areas where the pipes are covered with asbestos. And when we came home from the surface, that was not even recognized as a disease. Now, you'll, the, the progress of that disease is called meso, mesothelioma, mesothelioma, and that's a disease of the lungs. And uh, when the war was over, there were a million guys in hospital bed with an undesignated disease, post-traumatic stress disorder. Nobody wants to talk about stuff like that. So all those things are pushed to one side. 
And I don't it's just you'll get one or two staunch congressmen or senators and they get behind a bill and they force it to, to go to a conclusion. Now, we have a group of American mercenary veterans of World War II. Most people don't even know it exists. Write it down. American mercenary veterans of World War II. If you can't find them, you, 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 by the way, you have my email address. You let me know and I'll show you how to get there. And these, that they, they're a diminishing group. Uh, they're, none of their officers are veterans of World War II because there's nobody alive that can take that job. And I, speak, I spoke at the convention last year, and they're going to do one in New Orleans this year. And all people have to do, if you have a relative that was in the Merchant Marine, write to them. And they'll, they'll show you how you can get the, the, the Congressional Gold Medal. you at least be a, a, a appointed for it. But that doesn't happen in real life. So uh, what happens is, look, I'll give you one example. I know you have teachers and professors on, on board here. Let me give you an example. When I went to school, you had to learn to write cursive. There's a reason for it. No different than how you had to know your alphabet in first grade. If you don't get the foundation of something, you never get the full continuance of something. So in that sense, uh, I, I joke today, if we want to do things in disguise that our grandchildren don't understand, we write in cursive. We as a society do not look con they And so these people, they just never got around to doing it. Now, let me say this also. We weren't organized as a group. That group came home like everything else and went on to other things, building a family or getting a job or what have you. And they never fought for those rights. And if you don't fight for your rights, it becomes benign. And then just some good people pushed that bill through in 88 and, and the other things that they do for them today. Well, Mr. Yoho, I wanted to say that we sadly are running out of time. Um, I wanted to say from my on my behalf, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for what you did in World War II. And I myself believe that your role and the role of the Merchant Marines was absolutely vital to victory. If we had not survived during the Battle of the Atlantic, if, we, if you had not supplied Britain and the Soviet Union with all those in, unbelievably important goods, then we couldn't have launched D-Day, we couldn't have arrived in the European theatre and won that war in Europe. So thank you so, so much from me and also from friends. And without any further ado, uh, to wrap up today, I'm going to hand back to the Executive Director of Friends, Holly Rotundi in DC. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Pleased to be here.